start recording. Let's pray together. Blessed Father, all glorious God, gracious, good, awesome, and power, majesty, wonder, before whom the closest angels, Lord, just cannot stop saying, holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. And we give you glory and honor, and we ask in the name of Jesus, your blessed Son, our Lord, come Holy Spirit now. Lord, the longer I live, the more I know we are absolutely, utterly dependent upon you, your presence, your power, your life-giving work in our lives, in us and through us. And Lord, even as that song, this is the air I breathe, your holy presence. Lord, we pray and just breathe in even now. And then again, this is my daily bread, your very word. So we pray, come, blessed Holy Spirit, take these words to open up the word that you inspired. And may it not just simply be information, but transformation of our lives and hearts, oh God, in a mighty way. So we bind Satan and his work in any way to hinder us. And again, just come Holy Spirit, move in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I think if you went to the early service or the one that just happened, you know that we're transitioning in the summer to the book of Acts. And so in Sunday school, we'll be begin studying the book of Acts. And uh, has, it begins here. The book of Acts, I, probably I'm sure most of us, not all of us have read it. But it is like every other history that's ever been read. Uh, you can't be exhaustive. You take things that are important to the author or the authors. And so then those are the things that are highlighted. The book of Acts is a selected history of the significant events that uh, the Holy Spirit moved upon Luke, who is the author, uh, to write down. And these events basically are the significant events that are from the time of Jesus's resurrection in uh, Jerusalem and his appearance to uh, many people. And then the preaching of the gospel transition of through history of Paul's then coming to Rome to preach and stay there. And that's where I think most of us uh, are familiar with that. It ends there. Luke was a traveling companion of, of Paul. And uh, he undoubtedly was during the times that he was with Paul and Paul was in prison or whatever else. I'm certain, as it says in the gospel, Luke, he's had many sources, firsthand accounts, probably talked to Mary herself. <laughs> you know, that's why we have this stuff in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, all these other things that take place that are firsthand eyewitness accounts that Luke records. And so undoubtedly, he had eyewitness accounts that he then, uh, in different ways, recorded in, the, in uh, Luke and the book of Acts. Now, since the second century, this book has been called the Acts of the Apostle, all right? And I use the word, this is a distilled title, all right? And uh, the reason it's distilled is a couple reasons, as I say, is because, uh, first of all, it's not a record of all the Acts, in, in this sense, or just the Acts of all the Apostles, all right? You primarily focus upon Peter through about chapter 12, and then transition to Paul. So most of it has to do with the ministries one way or another uh, of overlapping between Peter and Paul. Uh, the second thing is that Acts records many other things than just simply the Acts of the Apostle, all right? You have uh, one thing that I really going through at this time, I went through focusing on the sermons all right, and trying to see, okay, what did they actually preach, which I'll mention here in, in a minute. But one of the things going through the book of Acts that hit me as never before was how much record there is of persecution. All right, and you know, you read it, but it never really stood out to me. And I think as I thought about that is that, well, it really wasn't relevant. You know, we haven't lived in a country and a nation where we as believers have in one way or another, experience persecution. But I think now, 
we are more and more aware of how a spirit of antichrist is so manifest in our culture and even in the quote unquote legacy media and whatever else they're coming out literally against Christians in the media as being opposed to you know what uh, progressives want and so the spirit of uh, persecution is on the rise and I think in this way too it can be one way or another very relevant to us some have suggested that acts be called the acts of the, uh, the holy spirit but uh, I think this is not really accurate because there's so many other things besides the work of the holy spirit uh, that, that take place in the book of acts now one of the things that I think is very important about the first verses, this section we're looking at, the first chapter, in one way also, then chapter two, is that it's important to see how foundational these verses are for the rest of the book. All right, you know, I can ask this question if you read the notes, you probably know, but what's the most important thing about a building? It's the foundation. I mean, if you don't set the foundation right, you know, you're in a tent, basically, all right, or it's going to fall over. Foundation is absolutely critical. And what happens often, in, because of whatever desires, interests people have, they'll go over very quickly Acts chapter 1 in the early verses. They'll kind of note this, note that, unless they are emphasizing something, but rarely see these verses as foundational, that these are setting fundamental principles that set forth what happens not only in the book of Acts, but what is to happen in all of history. And so these are critical things. One other thing that I want to emphasize too, is that if you have ever studied revival, all right, and I make a distinction between revival as technically and an awakening, all right, because revival means bringing back to life. All right, and so a revival is God's work among those who are, in one way or another, confessing true believers. Awakening, technically, is bringing non Christians to uh, salvation in Jesus. But these often go together. All right, but every great work of God in revival in history, in one way or another, has seen these fundamental principles that we see in these foundational verses and this chapter of Acts chapter one. And so the application is, is that if we want to see revival, if we wanna see God work in power in our church and his church in our nation, we need to understand these uh, principles and truly apply them truly live them out. So this is, this is, I think, very important for where we're living at. Now, Acts chapter 1, uh, and we'll go ahead and read verses 1 through 11. In the first book, O Theophilus, I, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons, but the Father is fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, 
Two men stood by them in white robes and said, and of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Amen. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Now, while there are so many things that we can emphasize here, there are four, four things that I want to highlight, all right, that I think are critically important. The first is the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now, as the gospel of Luke ends with the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ and also the promise that you will receive power of the Holy Spirit, the book of Acts actually begins with Christ, not with Christ's death on the cross, nor even his resurrection, but with his ascension. Notice it begins, until the day he was taken up. Then again, these verses culminate with the ascension and the angelic announcement that he will come again. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, this age, which as Jesus said, God himself is fixed by his own authority, begins with the ascension. Now, there's a cluster court, the death, resurrection, and ascension. But in many ways, the age itself begins and flows forth from the ascension. And it will end with, with Jesus' coming again from heaven to physically reign on earth. The ascension, and I want to emphasize this, the ascension of Christ controls and establishes a sovereign authority for the agenda of God's will and purpose during this age of history. Now, there are two critical things in life, period. Authority and power. That's it. Everything ultimately is about supreme authority and the power to execute whatever it is. And so that's what's being established here in these first, first uh, verses. Now, the ascension of Christ. It cannot be emphasized enough how important and significant this is in the transition, not only for this age of earthly history, but for all the unending ages of eternity, for the totality of the universe in heaven and on earth and all earthly and spiritual realms of existence. The ascension of Christ absolutely changes history forever. And we need to see this. We need to understand this so that we can understand who we are, where, what, what is happening in the universe, God's agenda. Now, as I go on to say, yet the poverty and failure to understand this is demonstrated by how little, if any, Christians even know about, let alone celebrate the ascension of Christ with his coronation, his crowning and enthronement at the right hand of God in heaven as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, just simply think about this. Compare this, for example, in liturgical churches like ours, you can even forget it about other contemporary churches that don't even have to think in terms of Christian culture, calendar, you know, whatever it is. But just think in liturgical church calendars, how much time, first of all, is devoted to the incarnation. You know, you have Advent, you have at least four, sometimes five weeks leading up to Christmas. So you have that on, on Christmas. Then think of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. You know, you have Lent, 40 days of Lent. Then you have the resurrection. How much time is devoted to the ascension of Lord Jesus Christ? You know, we'll have a sermon today, maybe, but so little. Okay, and I don't even think, I mean, and I, this is me too. I mean, years I taught and, and preached in other churches. I didn't even think about the ascension. You know, you come out of your culture, there it is, you're looking at what people want, what people need, but you don't really see what the Bible is telling us about how absolutely significant and critical the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ is. Now, again, if you were to ask Christians, what is the importance of the ascension, and what does it personally mean to you, most would probably have little, if any, idea. I do believe that. You know, take a survey, people... You know, Jesus ascended. Okay, well, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. What does it mean to you? Uh, not much. I don't know. But think, if you know, I just give two examples here. For example, in the first chapter of Ephesians, which is basically Paul's letter to churches, okay, uh, and it's oriented toward the ascension of Christ. 
And his prayer in the first chapter, okay, he prays for God to open up our hearts. These are people who have received Jesus Christ, as he said, the power of the Holy Spirit is in their life. He prays the eyes of their hearts will be opened to see more, to know God more, so that they'll know the hope of the calling, which means our ultimate destiny. The second thing is his inheritance in us. It's not our inheritance in him, which becomes this world. Like, what do we get out of it for, for ourselves? No, it's we are his. But then the foremost part of what Paul spends his time on in this prayer is that you will know the surpassing greatness of his power, which God exercised in raising Jesus from the dead and uh, causing him take, to be ascended to heaven and seated at his right hand far above every single name, power, anything else in this age and everything to come. We don't Live hardly with that reality, okay? Just another illustration, it's on the notes, but when, if you think of, for example, cultures like England that have royalty, kings or queens, you know, what is the most significant event in the life of the king or queen? The coronation. I mean, everything is about the king becoming enthroned. And in England, if you remember, they anoint the uh, royal person uh, by the priest, you know, in the sense that the archbishop would anoint him. So the, the ascension of Christ is so powerful. And again, if you think, moving on to page three here, uh, the book of Revelation, you know, you read that, I remember the first time I read that, I got done and I got on my knees and I just said, oh God, have mercy, please. <laughs> but the dreadful thing, so where does it begin? It begins chapter, you know, Jesus talks to the churches, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you're doing right, repent. Listen to the Holy Spirit. It's pretty simple. Uh, but, he, you know, it's God on the throne, the Father. Chapter 5 is Jesus enthroned above. Everything flows in history from the reality that Jesus Christ is Lord, King of kings over the whole universe. Now, the most important thing to understand about Christ's resurrection is that, that this was the almighty act of God himself and I emphasize this, in real time, space, history. The reason I emphasize that is because we live in a culture that's fantasy. You know, everybody's on their iPhone, they're in movies. We are programmed in a fantasy world. And quote unquote, religion can almost become fantasy. You know, you go through the stuff, you know, it's like, isn't this night? And we really don't live in the reality that what God did is in actual time, space, history, this really happened. This is what is, God has done himself to demonstrate what his purpose is in the earth, in the universe, in his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So it was God's supreme act of authority as to make Jesus, and again, the man, Jesus Christ, the man, Jesus of Nazareth, ruler of the whole universe. Ultimately, everything in life is controlled by the supreme authority, by supreme authority and power. And supreme authority in the cosmos, the universe is God Almighty who rules through his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a misprint here, only one, take out the end, but as everything for the rest of eternity is to be understood from the historic fact of his ascension. So, we are to live our lives in and under the reality that Jesus is Lord of all. Again, just it's not in the notes, but what is the fundamental historic initial confession of being a believer? It is not Jesus is my Savior. It is Jesus is Lord. It is not just my Lord, which is important. But see, what this Jesus is Lord, it's not just like it's my personal preference is Lord. And this, again, is important in the culture of the Roman culture, where Caesar is Lord. That means he is God. This, you know, when you have Augustus, he's God here on earth. His kingdom rules everything. Your total allegiance, your total of submission of your life is to be to Caesar. When Christians said, Jesus is Lord, they're saying, God has made Jesus the supreme ruler of the universe. From that reality, then comes, then I'm living in that world, which means he is my Lord, 
and I'm living in obedience to him. This is reality, whether people believe it or not, whether people live by it or not. Jesus is the Lord. Now, the sovereign authority and rule of the Lord Jesus Christ is exercised and manifested in what the Bible speaks of as the kingdom of God. All right. Do you know what the primary subject of Jesus was specifically in the Synoptic Gospels? The kingdom of God. It was the kingdom of God. God's kingdom. God's rule. Now, Acts 1-3 records that the overall subject of which Christ spoke to his chosen apostles during the 40 day period was not the meaning of his death on the cross, but the kingdom of God. I want to emphasize that again, okay, because this is a biblical perspective. Now, the kingdom of God, again, there's so much confusion and people have really <laughs> no or false ideas. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not biblically a static location, all right? Like people will think of the kingdom of God. I mean, here's how it's used. You know, Jesus said in, uh, in, in, or interpreted, uh, you know, unless a person is born from above, born from, again, that person will not enter what? The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so most people interpret that you're not going to go to heaven when you die, unless you're born of the spirit. Okay. That's not what Jesus is saying. Okay, he's not saying that. Okay, he's not talking about a place that you go to when you die. The kingdom of heaven is not a location. Kingdom is a word of dynamic power. And specifically, what we have to see our, it as is that it is where, how, and when God's will, his rule, his kingship, is being done. It's being manifested. It is a dynamic manifestation of the rule and the will of God. Does anybody know where those two concepts are put together? Yes, the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come. What does that mean? Your will be done. Does it mean I want to go to heaven when I die? No. It means that in the totality of the universe, what God's will is, and I'll give you another word for that, the Greek word translated will, telos, is a word that I think dynamically can be translated desire. Simply stated, the kingdom of God is where what God wants, what God desires, is being done. The state of being in relationship. Correct. That you live in relationship with God as your king, your ruler. And because of that, his rule, his will is being done. That's the kingdom of God. And the only way you enter that reality, because see, we are by nature enemies of God. Our hearts are against the rule of God because of the power of sin. The only way you will enter, quote unquote, under the actual true rule of God in your heart, your innermost being in relationship to God is to be born of God. You must have a absolutely new nature by the power of the Holy Spirit coming into your innermost being, your heart, to give you power to be able to live for God. The outward law of God, Ten Commandments or whatever, simply say to love God and love people, is the law of God. It tells us God's will. But we, by instinct, if we're walking in flesh and the power of sin, will fail at that one way or another. That, by the way, liturgically, I think many of us know that, but in the traditional service, so I don't know if the other ones, but especially traditional, you'll have in the beginning where it's, you know, the, the commandments, the great commandment, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, and what is the response after that? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The concept specifically is this, is this is the law of God. We are entering the presence of the holy, righteous God who is just of all. His commandment is to this. You know, if you're alive in any way, you are failing at this, and you're a sinner. And so you need the mercy of God. 
And so then liturgically, you confess your sin, and the priest then declares your sins are forgiven, so you're cleansed. So now you continue on in the, in the presence of God and in, in the worship of God. But the kingdom of God is the rule of God. Where God's will is being done is where his kingdom is. Now in heaven, of course, it's a place where God's kingdom is perfect. Because in heaven, everybody is doing God's will. Heaven is heaven, not because it's the place like you go to Disneyland. It's heaven because everybody there is living for God. God's holy, perfect, glorious, gracious, loving will. It's like everybody is in tune with God. Everything is the greatest symphony in the, there is that you can possibly think of. And a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth. And see, this is important, and I, and I emphasize this here. But see, the focus of the New Testament and the book of Acts, and really our prayer in the Lord's Prayer, if you notice it, is not heaven. Okay, it's not heaven. It's earth. God's will on earth. It's not pray and ask Jesus so you can go to heaven when you die. It's pray so your will, God's will can be done in your life so you can go to heaven if you die. We come back to reign with Jesus on earth forever and ever. God's will on earth. Now, this is important going on here. Uh, you know, Jesus spoke to them about the kingdom of God. Now, be, moving in the middle of that page, because the apostles understood that the kingdom of God means the rule of God on earth. Okay. Second, or B, they understood that the resurrection of Jesus was God's act and demonstration in history that Jesus is the Messiah. And again, this is a word that's so diluted. You know, we'll say Jesus Christ, which is the translation for Mashiach, Messiah. And it's kind of like his last name. No, biblically, Messiah means king. It means the anointed ruler of God's people. And this is why Jesus would say, I mean, uh, Paul would say Christ Jesus. You can say Lord Jesus. We often say that more. Or you say Christ Jesus. That means King Jesus. It means sovereign ruler Jesus. It's like saying what? Queen Elizabeth. It's not Elizabeth Queen. <laughs> you can say that, but it's Queen Elizabeth. It's King so-and-so. All right. Messiah means he's, he is the king. His resurrection, as Paul says in Romans chapter one, was God's act in history to declare Jesus to be Lord of all. So the disciples understand God's kingdom is to come on earth. They understand Jesus is now the king designated by this historic act. And then they also understood, then the third thing, that the promises of God in the Old Testament is that God would rule through his people, Israel, on earth. All right, so they got their prophecy right. But the problem is, they didn't have it initially, but they were expecting, is it at this time? All right, and this is one of the problems that Christians have. We get right prophecies, but we put our little prophecy chart wrong, and then we believe in our prophecy chart more than we do in the Word of God, where it doesn't work. And it, see, the, anyway, I don't want to go into that too much, but they're thinking like, okay, these are now, is this what's going to happen? Okay, by the way, do you remember what happened in Palm Sunday? What were they expecting then? They were expecting Jesus to come in and be king. Yay, we're going to rule with Jesus. I can't wait. And then what happens? He's crucified. What an absolute total disappointment. I mean, it's hard to understand how totally devastating. It's like, it's like uh, you're a Yankee fan. The Red Sox win the World Series after you're almost there. You know, it's like, who knows how horrible that was. Anyway, so... <laughs> uh, so they are now thinking like, okay, is this God's time that this is going to happen? All right. And what does Jesus say? He responds to them and he, and he responds by telling them that the accomplishment of God's agenda for the manifestation of his kingdom rule during this age, notice from the ascension to the second coming involves three other absolutely essential foundational principles. And that's what we'll look at. We hardly have any time, but nevertheless, first of all, that there'll be witnesses. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be 
my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. Now, the phrase my witnesses is essential. It's an essential responsibility and a task with which Jesus commissioned his chosen apostles, as well as the whole church uh, that they would establish. Now, this is important how we understand Acts and what we are to do as believers. Because of this, Acts records a number of accounts of witness. Now, what's another word for witness? Testimony. Exactly. We talk about giving a testimony. What is a testimony? It's a story about what? It's a what? A story about how Christ changed your life. You have personally encountered the living Lord Jesus Christ. And that encounter of meeting the living Lord Jesus Christ has changed, has transformed your life in some way, somehow. You give testimony to that. This is what most of Acts is about. Them being witnesses of what? The living, resurrected, ascended Lord Jesus Christ whose personal presence has come into my life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm testifying to that. And these people also, the early uh, apostles and others, saw him personally. And so you can see these, uh, basically, a Peter's sermon uh, to the devout Jews, a number of different kinds of people throughout Acts. Acts chapter 2, the Jews. You know, you go to chapter 10, it's the Gentiles. Chapter 17, it's Paul in Athens with the uh, intellectual uh, Greeks. And so every sermon actually is different. There are certain things that are, you know, together, but certain things are oriented toward the audience, toward who those people are. Uh, you know, for you know, I didn't put it in here, but when you look at Peter's sermon to Cornelius, Peter's sermon mentions Jesus as Lord and to bring peace. Well, that was Pax Romana. The, the, the uh, uh, Romans wanted to rule Caesar's rule to bring the peace of Rome. And so he's speaking to this uh, centurion who's a devout centurion, uh, 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 Cornelius, and he understands his mentality. Now, I want to emphasize this. See, if you look at the bottom, this, this demonstrates the enormous importance and power of personal testimonies. And by the way, pray for David Richardson who God has uh, put upon his heart to start recording personal testimonies, to send them out. Can I get a witness for the glory of God? That's what we're, and we want to just put out you know, personal testimonies of what God has done. Now, over page four. It is vital to see what is foremost in the witness of the sermons, testimonies, and testimonies recorded in Acts. In other words, the primary focus of the declaration of the gospel they preached. Now, think about this. If you were to ask most Christians, what was the content of the gospel the apostles preached today, you know, in the book of Acts? They would say, well, probably Jesus died on the cross so I can go to heaven when I die. That's the gospel nowadays. That's not what they preached, okay? If, when you look at a survey, as I did, if you look at the book of Acts and look at the sermons, you know how many, you can see it there, you know how many times the death of Christ is even mentioned? Eight. That's it. Only eight times. And all of those, virtually one way or another, have to do with simply him being killed. You murdered him. You killed him. So they're not preaching Christ died on the cross for your sins. Now, that becomes important, again, in the book of Romans and later things, and we focus on that. But what they are witnessing to is not the death as such. It's the resurrection, the lordship, the rule of Jesus Christ. His death has meaning because he's been raised from the dead. If Jesus just died and wasn't raised, he's just like any other person in all of history that's crucified that nobody ever heard of. You know, so it, that's what they witness to. Christ has risen. He is the Messiah. He is taken up to heaven. He is the Lord of Lords. Now, also, just one other thing, as I mentioned here, <clears throat> a vital and critical element to underline about the preaching is that this man, Jesus, okay, was raised from the dead and ascended to heaven. Now, I, I make mention of this because, see, many Christians who are Bible-believing grew up in whatever evangelical churches are looking at Jesus and the Bible 
in an anachronistic, meaning false time frame, from 325 AD after the uh, council, council at Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was after basically three centuries of struggle about the deity of Jesus Christ. And it came to the Trinity, but that was focused as much on the deity of Jesus Christ. And so people who are Christians who confess that, you go back to the Gospels, you go back to Acts, and basically you read Jesus as God, you know, and people hardly even think of him as a man. And you, you, you view his whole life that way. He walked on water because he was God. He did miracles because he was God. That's not what the Bible says. He was a man anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit, who then, as uh, Philippians said, he emptied himself, which was you can't stop being God. He just did not use his prerogatives as God, his power as God, but it was the God, man, and one person getting a lot of theology. But my point is this, who is in heaven now? Jesus, son of God, eternally, who became a human being in the incarnation, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross, raised from the dead, and now is ascended to heaven. It is a man who is ruling over the totality of the universe, a human being. That, by the way, you can get into a lot of theology there, but why is Satan so attacking humans? Because human beings are made in the image of God. And fundamentally, what is God's purpose? And we, we say this in discipleship now, but if you're getting it, but what is discipleship ultimately about? It is being transformed to become like Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the word of God. This is the vision. That's what it is, to become like Christ. And we will reign forever and ever with him. That's God's purpose. Now, Acts chapter one uh, emphasizes the mission, the preaching of the gospel uh, to the ends of the earth. And I, I just want to make note of the <clears throat> last thing down there. While mission should include compassion for the poor, the commission of the church is to not to be a human services organization, but to preach the gospel. What good is it if we feed everybody, they all, we have some, I read recently in a quote unquote Christian site, we're to end the cycle of poverty. Really? I don't see that. Jesus didn't say that. You meet, help the poor, feed the sick or whatever. That's what Christ did. We understand that. But the commission of the church is to bring the gospel so people's souls are eternally saved. It's not one or the other, but it's what we're ultimately about. All right, moving on. Now, these two important things. Three is what Jesus emphasized. The empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, those are my terminology, empowering presence. Okay, as the foundational verses of Acts chapter 1, uh, 1 through 11, emphasize the empowering manifest presence of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential for the establishment of Christ's kingdom on earth. Now, this can hardly be clear. When you look at these verses, you can just breeze through them, whatever. But what is the, con the, the purpose is the kingdom, God's rule. But what is the focus of Jesus's primary emphasis? The Holy Spirit. Two times, fundamentally, he's saying this is what it's about. The promise of the Father, that's how Luke ends. You will be clothed with power from on high. He says this, you're going to receive the promise of Father. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit. A critical aspect of Jesus' ascension and kingdom reign from heaven was to receive and then pour out the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit for witness and life. How is Jesus ruling on earth? Fundamentally, it is in the real, actual dynamic of the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses the word of God. He uses sacraments. He moves into people so that people are gifted and anointed and empowered so that we are the body of Christ that functions to become the living Lord Jesus Christ in the world and witness. But Jesus reigns and rules personally through the person of the Holy Spirit in people's minds. You enter the kingdom of God, the rule of God, relationship with God in an actual true living way. How? 
by the Holy Spirit, being born again. You have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have a lot of time to go. I'll just say this. Some people look at this as regeneration. You know, this is when they were born again. I, I just don't know how you can see that unless you're just against, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit. These guys had been anointed in many ways. They had power, authority when they were working with Jesus. The Holy Spirit worked through all the Old Testament. They saw Jesus raised from the dead. They're already in the kingdom in many ways. They are to receive power. Now, let me ask you this. If the man Jesus, God incarnate, came upon earth and had to be anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit, he's not being born again. <laughs> he's being empowered. If the apostles who experienced all that during their life and ministry and saw the resurrected Jesus, they had the word of God. He said, you have to have power. How much do we have to have that power? We must have that power. That's why Jesus told them, you will receive power. And this is what you see all through the scripture. You see these people that are nobodies, whatever, Gideon or, you know, all these other people. I'm the least of the nobodyest and the Holy Spirit comes upon. David, the Holy Spirit comes upon. This is the power of the Spirit coming upon people outside of us in many ways, but moving in us and through us to accomplish his purpose. Why? We are a world at war. There are two ultimate powers in this universe. There is the power of God through Jesus Christ, with powers, and I'm going to be technical here, the power of sin. It's not the power of Satan. It's the power of sin. Satan is the biggest sinner. Jesus didn't simply die to break the rule of Satan. He died for sins because it's the power of sin that has to be overcome. And so because sin is overcome, the power of Satan is overcome. Power must come by the Holy Spirit. So the power to live in the Spirit is the gift of God so that we can do His will to overcome sin within, Satan without, and bring the gospel. We are a world at war internally, externally. It is war and power, spiritual power, is what it's ultimately all about. All right? <clears throat> Look at the last thing there in that thing I say. The greatest reason churches are not fulfilling their God-given mission to preach the gospel, to reach the lost, and this is a definition of uh, what we're saying of discipleship here, to make followers, and that's not just a decision. These are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose lives are being formed, transformed, formed into likeness of Jesus Christ so that they are fulfilling God's purpose is this because they are not being filled with, walking in, according to, and living in the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't have time to go on this, but I'll just say this real quick. Most Christians, many Christians, I don't want to say, but if you ask them their favorite verse, book, book of the Bible, I mean, what their identity is, they'll go, I'm a Romans 7 Christian. You know, I tried to live for God, but I can't, you know, the things I want... A Romans 7, if you know what I'm talking about, the things I want to do, I don't do, I can't do. That's a person in the flesh. A Christian can live like that. But that's just flesh person. Paul goes on in chapter 8 to say, we are been set free by the power of the Holy Spirit from sin, by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that God's rule and will. Our identity is that Jesus is Lord. I've been born of God. I am a new creation. The Holy Spirit of God lives in me. I have been set free from the power of sin so that by dying to self and sin and the flesh, I can live in the power of the Holy Spirit so that what God wants is being done in my life because what God wants is what I want because of the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. And so his life is lived in me. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the Christian identity. One last thing now. Move on. This is the other absolute critical essential. Prayer with the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is another essential foundational element <clears throat> of Christ. Because prayer is, notice these words, the one thing to which Jesus connects the receiving of the power of the Holy Spirit. So one thing. 
Okay. Again, you know, we try to be holy, this or that, but see, again, think about this. I mean, obviously we want to be holy. That's what we're supposed to be. But what is the Greek word for a spiritual gift? Charismata. Charis means what? Grace. Grace. What is grace? It means it doesn't depend upon you. It depends upon God. God's will, purpose upon you because you're a sinner and God uses sinners because he ain't got nobody else. <laughs> so we want to be holy, but if we think the holier I get, it, that's what depends on the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, in a certain way, okay, but not ultimately. It's the grace of God. God uses the most amazing people that are unbelievable. Look in the Bible, you know, just look at yourself. Anyway, what is the one essential that Jesus ties power of the Holy Spirit to? Prayer. Prayer. That's why he says two things. It says, or first of all, he said, wait in Jerusalem. Now, wait doesn't mean like, okay, we're waiting on the promises. You know, wait con conceives is a word uh, conceptually meaning pray. And that's the second thing we see. What did they do when they saw Jesus and the angel told them, go back, wait? What did they do? They prayed. One other thing, we'll look at that next week, which was important. But the thing they devoted themselves to was prayer. Prayer. Why is the Holy Spirit not manifesting himself in power in our lives, in the church, in the church? the way God wants him to. The poverty of prayer. We're just not praying. We're living our life. We're comfortable. Maybe all the persecution will bring people to alert going, uh-oh, we're in trouble. We need God. Yeah, hello. You know, but we must devote ourselves to prayer. And I want to encourage everybody, one way or another, get with people to pray. Pray once a week with people. Pray with your spouse for revival. But pray with people. Because they devoted themselves to prayer. And when they were in prayer in God's time and his appointed time, the Holy Spirit was poured out. And again, this is it. They're praying at 8.59 and 59 seconds. They're one way. There's Peter who had denied Jesus. He couldn't even stand up before a slave girl. Nine o'clock in the morning. The power of God comes upon these people. Peter stands up before thousands of people to give a bold witness of what Jesus did. It's like, that's power. That's power. Amen? Amen. Father, we bless you. We praise you. And we call to you even now, Lord. We ask, first of all, forgive us for the poverty of our prayer. Second, Lord, stir our hearts with greater holy desire, which is your desire, to pray, to devote ourselves, and for your purpose that Jesus would reign. And so we simply ask in the name of Jesus, come Holy Spirit, pour out your presence, be poured out upon us and move to bring revival and awakening. Lord, we give you glory and honor. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody.